faculty and non-teaching staff of our CF schools from all the regions in the Philippines, and even those watching across the world. I am Carlo Abadines, Advocacy and Information Management Officer of CEAP and coordinating this event on behalf of the CEAP National Office and the National Higher Education Commission. Welcome to the opening ceremonies of the 2020 CEAP National Higher Education Commission Summit. This is the first ever virtual summit organized by the National Higher Education Commission, and it surely will be a unique experience for us all as we listen to panel discussions and reflect collectively on what we've been through and what we are going through in this pandemic, especially with respect to continuing our mission in higher education. We'd like to thank our newly elected Cardinal Advincula for presiding the opening Eucharistic celebration of our summit. His words of hope and encouragement is something that we will hold on to, um, especially as we continue to reflect on our experience this past month. No? So without further ado, let us formally begin the 2020 National Higher Education Commission Summit. I would like to invite the president of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, Sister Maria Marisa RVV, RVM, to give the welcoming remarks. To our distinguished guests, panel speakers who will be properly introduced later, members of the CEAP Higher Education Commission with Father Jobert Villas as chair, and all the participants to the NHEC Higher Education Institution Summit. Good afternoon. On behalf of the CAP Board, I would like to welcome everyone to the Higher Education Institution Summit, regardless of the many different circumstances that would otherwise be expected. For eight months now, our lives have been affected in so many ways by this coronavirus pandemic. This dreaded disease has turned our lives upside down, causing a breakdown or disruption in our usual or normal daily activities. Depending on our capacity to adapt to the situation, our stress and anxieties are piqued by fear of contracting coronavirus. The numbers of confirmed positive cases and deaths from COVID-19 continue to rise. We face a painful reality as we continue to collectively struggle as a people, whether it be our families, our friends, those who have lost their loved ones, and the many others who lost a job or have their incomes reduced to this pandemic. While the story of COVID-19 continues, we also face the devastating effect of the super typhoons that hit our country in the past weeks. In both cases, the education sector has not been spared. Our higher education institutions have not been spared. Amid the uncertainty, we have tried our best to cope, for we believe that our mission should continue, proclaiming and preserving our Catholic identity, balancing it with institutional leadership in addressing academic, financial and personal decisions and safety. As we transition, we are also mindful of organizational efficiency and effectiveness to ensure quality. This three-day higher education summit will provide us the opportunity to think and reflect on how we have responded to the disruptions caused by the pandemic. While listening to the different panelists, we can think about how we have advanced the goal, goals of Catholic education amid the situation and context we are in. We ask ourselves, how are we doing God's work in all of this? Have we become more strategic, more committed, and clearer with our mission? Facing the tumult, we need to find purpose and deep meaning behind this dark cloud that can bring new life. In the midst of the crisis, crosses, and crossroads, we stand up to proclaim that we are a resurrection people, having an unwavering faith and abiding trust in God and in His Son, Jesus Christ, that moves us into action. 
John chapter 10 verse 10 tells us that Christ came so that we may have life and have it abundantly. Let us not allow the disruptions to make us live short of that abundance. Let us, by our life, to be able to bring life to all and bring it to the fullest, shaping lives and saving futures for the common good. With this, I wish everyone a fruitful and productive summit. May God bless us all. challenges we face, we continue to hold on in faith to Jesus who, continue, who called us to this mission of education. Um, I think we are just facing uh, a bit more in terms of technical uh, difficulties. Um, are we okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for, the sh for sure, the next three days will be a time for us to gain insights from the stories of our various panelists who come from very different backgrounds. As we listen to these stories, we are also being invited to reflect on what we've gone through for the past months in this time of a pandemic. To explain further the rationale and objectives of the 2020 NHEC Summit, I would like to invite the chairperson of the CEAP National Higher Education Commission, Father Jose Gualberto I. Villas. Distinguished trustees and officials of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, fellow servant leaders of Philippine Catholic higher education institutions, honored guests and resource persons, ladies and gentlemen, isang magandang araw po sa ating lahat. It took the COVID-19 pandemic for us to rewire, reconfigure, and reimagine higher education. While the crisis continues to overwhelm all of us, especially our learners and their communities, it likewise brings Catholic higher education institutions at the crossroads of enabling change. This is why we are convening the 2020 CAP NHEC Summit. During last year's summit, I mentioned that we need to respond to the call to three E's. Excitement, exploration, and emancipation. It was a call to excitement because the higher education innovation at the level of policy and practice is gaining more traction. It was a call to exploration because we wanted to see our respective institutions to become more mindful of alternatives and opportunities in designing and delivering learning experiences. It was a call to emancipation because we wanted our institutions to break free from the monolithic view of higher education qualifications. This year, and with the pandemic causing more changes to happen almost every day, Catholic higher education institutions face a new set of E's. The first is inquiry. First we is wanted inquiry. to critically examine we wanted this course of crisis and crosses and crosses that we are experiencing individually as institutions and collectively as institutions and collectively as an association. We want the second is engagement. The emerging we want to maximize the emerging landscape of knowledge generation and sharing that is anchored on technological connectivism, but is deeply taking comfort in a newfound valuing of creationism. 
We the want third to ensure is empowerment. That we translate we our want crisis. to ensure crosses that we translate and our crisis into a renewed sense and of being one. Into we a renewed church. sense of being in one. Catholic we the church truly in making more Catholic rooted education in the teachings of truly Christ. more rooted so in the teachings of Christ. In the recent so appropriately captured in the recent inside of the Holy Father Tutti, where the Holy Father mentioned, and I quote. quote Concern education for others, and upbringing, a concern of for others, a well-integrated view all of life and spiritual growth, all these are essential for quality human relationships and for enabling society itself to react against injustices, aberrations, and abuses of economic, and technological, political, and, of course, and media. Power. Through the theme, and of course, Christifying our through crisis, the theme, Christifying our crisis, crosses and crosswalks, Christifying the mission of Catholic higher education. We, seek to, we seek to find reason and rhyme in what the pandemic has brought us. For inquiry, a golden opportunity for inquiry. Engagement, the National Higher Education Commission, the National Higher Education that Commission helping us believes together, that by helping us reflect together with the expert opinions and inside of our esteemed international and local resource persons, we be able to effectively connect the context of Philippine Catholic and higher emerging education of global within an emerging stage of global cooperation in facilitating a new stage of growth in the education sector. Speaking of first time, the 2020 CAPN Summit is first in three ways. And it is summit. the first virtual and first time. summit. We are holding it is also in the first time with we are holding it in conjunction with the World or Access to Higher Education no Day or WAHID. We no less than its founder, of the National Dr. Graeme Atherton of the National of Education the Opportunities Kingdom, Network as one of, our of the United persons. Kingdom. As one it of is our also the first time persons that we are opening it is also the first the time saint, that we are opening it no on the feast day of a saint who is no stranger to disease and floods. Saint Elizabeth of Hungary. Saint of Hungary. Indeed, talk about in timing. So many ways Indeed, we come together. In so many ways, a lot we come of together to celebrate a lot of first the circumstances. Despite and in spite of no, the never, circumstances. The spirit of communion no, binds us never. even tighter. The spirit of communion binds us other. even tighter as we rely on each other and revivifying our mission as Catholic higher education institutions. In our analysis May we find crisis, great meaning in our analysis crosses. of our crisis all at crosses the service and crosswords. All at the service of every learner whose by life God, was entrusted to us by a loving God who continues to strengthen us and love in faith Maraming hope, salamat and po love at mabuhay Maraming ang salamat CAP po at NHEC mabuhay Summit ang CAP NHEC Summit 2020. Thank you, Father Jober, for sharing with our participants the rationale and objectives of the 2020 NHEC Summit. Indeed, it has been quite a journey since the last NHEC Summit where we focused on three E's, excitement, exploration, and emancipation. And today, we now focus on another three E's, inquiry, engagement, and empowerment as we continue to face the challenges brought about by the pandemic. I believe our panelists, uh, some uh, um, panelists will be uh, joining us a bit later, but we will begin with our program and I'm really excited for this panel that is jam-packed with experts in the field of education worldwide. So this is a time for us to get a perspective from across the, the world, from different regions. And so without further ado, I would like to pass on the virtual mic to Dr. Edison Fermin, the moderator for our international panel entitled Critiquing Crisis Response. Did we provide a unified but contextualized response? Good afternoon, everyone. Isang mapagpala at mapagpalayang hapon po sa ating lahat. I am very pleased to join all of you in this uh, August gathering 
of the key leaders in Catholic higher education in the Philippines, along with other guest resource persons from around the globe. Catholic higher education institutions all over the world are mindful of how the pandemic has rapidly altered the academic, operational, and economic dimensions of the education sector. Through the perspectives of international experts in Catholic higher education, we hope that this first session will serve as an assessment of how Catholic higher education institutions or CHEI institutions or CHEI institutions or CHEI Participants are also expected to understand the impact of global conditions affecting the life of CHEIs and to anticipate how this CHEI higher education will likely influence further responses of Philippine Catholic higher education institutions. I'm sure that you have some thoughts and insights already brewing in your heads and maybe in your hearts at this point, but I'd like to give a few reminders before we proceed. First, all of your videos will be saved in, all of our videos will be saved in the video section of our official Facebook page and in our YouTube CAP channel. If you miss out on a session, you can just go to these sites to view them again at your own convenience. Now, for those in the Zoom webinar room, feel free to post your questions as the discussion unfolds. These questions will be asked during the question and answer portion of our panel discussion. And please be informed that you will receive the certificate of attendance only upon completion of our evaluation form. The link will be posted in the comment section later for FB and YouTube Live and will be available online until seven in the evening uh, on the last day of our uh, three-day engagement. For those in the Zoom webinar room, it will be posted in our chat box and will be sent by email to you. Again, evaluation forms will have a limited period of access, so you'd better make sure that you know when to access uh, the evaluation link. And lastly, we encourage you to share this webinar along with the rest of uh, the days we will be together online to your networks with the hashtags, hashtag CAPCares, and hashtag I love Catholic N. So I guess without much further ado, we can uh, be introduced to the members of this distinguished uh, panel. Our first member of the panel is the president of the Catholic University of Portugal or UCP and was elected president of the International Federation of Catholic Universities or IFCU last July 2018. She is a full professor of German and Cultural Studies at UCP's School of Human Sciences and holds a PhD in German Studies. She founded the Research Center for Communication and Culture or CECC at UCP and has held numerous visiting professor professorships in various universities across the world and maybe soon we'll see her in the Philippines. She's the author of over 140 publications, Bridging Cultural Theory, Inter-Arts Studies, Visual Culture, Culture and Conflict. In 2019, she was considered amongst Portugal's top women in science by the Cientia Viva Foundation. Recently, she was appointed by Pope Francis to serve in the Scientific Council of the Holy See's Higher Education Accrediting Agency, or AVIPRO. Please help me welcome the President of the International Federation of Catholic Universities, Dr. Isabel Capiloa Hill. Good afternoon, Dr. Hill, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, panel. Good afternoon. Our, our second speaker is the, or has been the rector of Soji Pranata Catholic University since 2017, and is currently a board member of the Association of Southeast and East Asian Catholics and Catholic Colleges and Universities. He holds 
a PhD in computer information systems um, and is a full professor for computer information systems since 2017. He also holds the master's in internet and e-commerce technology. Talk about the waves of the future in terms of academic disciplines. And he has numerous publications, including 115 books of information technology, 135 mass media articles, and 35 scientific articles. Please help me welcome Dr. Ridwan Sanjaya. Thank you, Dr. Edison. Bagaimana, saudara? Baik, baik. Our next speaker is a missionary priest of the Congregation of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, popularly known in the Philippines as CICM missionaries, and is currently the seventh president of St. Louis University. Among the highlights of his missionary life includes his being chosen by Pope John Paul II to be a pioneer missionary together with two CI. CM priests to Mongolia in 1992 for his exemplary work of caring for the street children in Mongolia's capital Ulan Batar in Mongolia. Father Gilbert received the highest award conferred by the Mongolian government upon a foreigner, the Genghis Khan Honor Medal of the Great Mongolia State. In 2007, he returned to the Philippines and has since then been involved in the education ministry of various capacities. A member of the Board of Trustees of CICM schools and of a number of Philippine National Educational Associations. Currently, he is the president of the Association of Catholic Universities of the Philippines or ACUP and holds a PhD in educational management. Please welcome Reverend Father Gilbert B. Sales. CICM PhD. Good afternoon, Father Gilbert. Okay, I think uh, uh, we'll see if our final speaker will be able to join us because he's launching the other uh, global events of the World Access to Higher Education Day, which is uh, happening as we are also having the CAP. National Higher Education Summit. So uh, again, we would like to invite our uh, participants that should you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, use our chat room and we'll try to include your questions as we move along. So there are two main questions that will constitute this conversation. And I will be calling on our speakers to share their insights or perspectives relative to these two items. The first one has something to do with the greatest challenge that the pandemic has brought upon higher education in general around the globe, and in particular, Catholic higher education institutions. And we would love to find out from our speakers, how will this challenge likely change further or evolve as we anticipate the post-pandemic context. So we will ask our esteemed guest from IFCU, Dr. Hill, to begin sharing her thoughts. And after Dr. Hill, we'll be uh, calling on uh, Dr. Sanjaya and then Father Gilbert. Dr. Hill, please. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to, to be here with you uh, uh, today at this uh, summit uh, of the CAP. I'm very honored for the invitation. Um, well, I, I could start perhaps with um, a broad uh, uh, discussion of uh, what the great the greatest challenges are. Uh, and it's hard to speak of issues uh, that speak to the different Catholic higher education institutions in global terms, because one of the things that COVID has done, although this is a global pandemic, the uh, the the uh, issues and the um, critical aspects of the impact of COVID have largely been diversified by uh, context. 
Um, so I, I, I will just uh, start with uh, a few, um, let's say, major guidelines, but which will need to be con contextualized and that may have had different impacts uh, across the globe. So I would say the first uh, challenge is access. Um, the transition uh, in most areas of the globe uh, from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to uh, remote learning has brought uh, an added stress um, on uh, lower income students uh, because it's, uh, they require the ownership not only of devices, but access to um, IT capabilities and Wi-Fi uh, bandwidth um, that cannot be taken for granted. This has been clearly an issue uh, of uh, schools, primary schools, secondary schools, and we see it with differences from the global north to the global south, uh, but we cannot take it away that this is also an issue uh, for uh, higher education. Um, and so the, the, the question of keeping all our constituencies, let's say all our students, um, be able to participate in the new uh, mode uh, of learning is certainly uh, an issue that we uh, have had to take into consideration in, in the Federation and um, uh, that um, impact differently the institutions uh, ranging from wealthier, well-to-do um, uh, universities and colleges to those that operate in more fragile environments. And there is the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, um, uh, the income differences have affected deeply as well our work as um, Catholic institutions. Uh, linked with this issue of access, which I think is, is more critical, is uh, naturally uh, also the um, uh, uh, technical requirements for this change. Um, Although we have been speaking uh, broadly about technological, about digital transformation, um, certainly more in Asia than other parts of the globe, because I think that uh, uh, this is something that ha where um, uh, uh, Asian uh, countries have clearly been leading the way, um, but all the hurdles to uh, digital transformation have in a way, if not disappeared, uh, the the rationale for this transformation has had an acceleration with uh, with COVID, um, and this requires also uh, preparation on the side of uh, the institutions. It requires investment uh, on the side of the institutions. And again, we see the same um, gap uh, between uh, institutions uh, that have more solid finances than from the others who operate in more critical um, situations. At my own institution, for, in for instance, one of the things we had to do was to uh, place um, equip all the the the, um, uh, uh, the rooms on campus and we are a national university so we have four campi uh, in 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 the country we had to uh, invest and place cameras professional cameras and microphones with um, automatic tracking uh, devices so that the students who would stay at home or faculty members who would be forced to stay at home could either teach from uh, from home or the, the students who were infected or were quarantining could still take the classes as they were occurring on campus. As you can imagine, this was a huge investment and the university had to to, to um, get our resources to 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 the, to do this, and this is just a tiny example because there are many others. So, the um, the technological requirements was certainly a challenge for most uh, for most uh, institutions. Another one is uh, um, pedagogical and methodological. Um, faculty was not prepared for the differences required for uh, uh, for remote learning. Um, so they had to take, in many cases, a crash course 
but how to use not only use the technology, but to adapt their lecturing uh, models to, um, to to remote learning, to the interactions with students online, uh, to the shortened attention span, which uh, students certainly have in a Zoom or a, a Teams or any other platform um, uh, lecture. Um, so I think these these three, let's say, broadly global um, uh, challenges, which are more institution, will then overlap with something else, um, which is a challenge about for uh, recruitment. Um, in this situation, um, many families, uh, many students have. Um, uh, decided to uh, take a gap year uh, and wait out the pandemic before resuming uh, classes. Um, what we have witnessed as, at IFCU uh, is that this has also brought an added strain on uh, to institutions uh, that are not publicly funded and that rely on the finances and tuition of, of students. Um, there are quite a number, a large number of uh, colleges that are due uh, to uh, be uh, merged with larger institutions or simply uh, close out because they don't have have the means to, to continue their work. So I, what we will be seeing globally uh, in the broad network of Catholic colleges and universities is uh, um, a, a, a narrowing down, a trimming uh, of the number of institutions, which is certainly uh, a danger and, and a hazard uh, for our uh, work as faith-based and um, as faith-based um, institutions. And I would keep it at there and then continue. Wonderful. Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Hill. And I guess um, she has given us a, a very nice and comprehensive uh, perspective on what's happening not only in Portugal, but uh, seemingly what's happening at the global scale for Catholic educational institutions. So over to you, uh, Dr. Sanjaya, for uh, uh, your perspectives, please. Yeah, okay, thank you, Dr. Edison. It is an honor for me to be here in NHAC Summit 2020. Yeah, and the problem that we face in the pandemic are quite systemic and multi-dimensional but might be a, more about mindset. Because like uh, Dr. Isabel said, uh, because we have limited access, we cannot do activities freely in the pandemic. The productivity in some area decreases. So it has impact on the people, on the income and salary of the people. Then. The impact continues on the ability to buy and pay. And for those have relation with the impact chain, will have problem with the income. And university will also will have the, uh, the problem in that, in that areas. But the other hand, the pandemic also caused change in the teaching and learning process. Yeah, previously we can teach physically and we love it because that's why we 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 did as a lecturer. But now we must done it virtually and it is uh, totally changed differently, significantly. And switching is not that something easy for us. There are several reactions. Those who refuse, those who reduce the quality, yeah. Uh, only did the, the function, but they're not that quality. But also we have those who can do perfectly and easily. But in fact, the quality of education services also affect the perception of the people who pay during the difficult times. The, uh, the people, the people who pay the, the uh, the, uh, the education during the difficult times is not is not uh, that easy to accept that the education the quality of education is decreased and they should pay and still have to pay 
This is the problem of the mindset. And the third, there is one characteristic that cannot be lost from the Catholic educational institution, which is, we know, is empathy for those who experiencing difficulties. In the pandemic, we cannot remain silent to relieve the problem, the, uh, the difficulty situation. But the situations uh, different from, from previously. Some people really need the help, but some people might take advantage of the situation because now we can say this, this is chaotic situation, chaotic condition, different from before. The truth has not become a common concession. Some people said this is correct and they can, they can take advantage in the situation, Some, but we know this is not correct. Yeah, if this condition continues, then educational institution might experience problem. However, we, we, we thought to continue to adapt in any condition. Doing activities in new ways and new condition must be done. We should explore, yeah? exploration in new ways and teaching must continue. Information technology based service that is student need to be prepared. But efficiency in the use of the budget also needs to be done. Even though we have to serve any health equipment for the school. In our campus in Unika Sugio Pranato, we are lucky and feel blessed because since 2009, we already prepare for the hybrid learning. So we continue for the improvement until 2019. When the pandemic come and we have to stop the activity uh, physically, we, we just change directly. We just change directly uh, to be virtually. And we already prepare for that situation, but not, not predict it will become as a, a real situation. But luckily, we can serve, uh, we can serve to the student the normal situation for the education. And we feel survive. Yeah, until now, we, we run the, the semester for, for two semester and it's still okay. And every, everything that we prepare must be increased and it needs more budget than previously. But sometimes, sometimes, uh, the people say that because the education not uh, not be done in physically, so budget might be decreased. So it have to be solved. Uh, the the situation, the real situation, is not something like that. We also have to prepare more more budget, more money to serve in this situation. But uh, again, because we choose as a Catholic education institution, so the excellency cannot be avoided. So even though the situation is not, uh, is not common, it's not uh, easy, we have to prepare, we have to serve in good situation for the student and for the stakeholder. Something like that. Okay, um, I'm uh, uh, quite happy that you mentioned about the uh, plethora of information or misinformation uh, around us, uh, given the situation. And I think uh, in a little while, we'll uh, discuss more of that as a core issue in the response of Catholic uh, higher education institutions. But uh, in the meantime, um, we'll uh, ask uh, Father Gilbert uh, to share with us his perspective. Father Gilbert? Please. Thank you, Dr. Ed. Uh, you know, in the Philippines, the pandemic really caught everyone by surprise. Though momentarily in a state of shock in the beginning, individual institutions like schools 
colleges and universities had to learn to cope up with this unprecedented situation and the challenges that it posed to us. And let me just uh, uh, tell you a few of the challenges that we had to face. As uh, was Dr. Isabel saying uh, earlier, the first was connectivity. Uh, most of our students, or especially here in Baguio, uh, live in remote villages, mountain villages, and they do not have connectivity. So we had to address that. Uh, we had to reach them by, uh, by having this correspondence-based learning, or what we call CBL. Aside from the OBL or the online based learning. But the second uh, challenge, I think, is our teachers, our instructors, and professors were not really prepared for this kind of online based learning or correspondence based learning. And that is why training has to com commence immediately to be able to train our teachers to face the challenges of delivering their lessons to all our students. The third uh, challenge that I saw was uh, uh, the issues on mental health. More and more we saw uh, cases of suicides, attempted suicides, stress-related problems, anxieties cropping up, especially during the first days of the lockdown. You know, in Baguio, the first week was, uh, well, the mayor said that we will only have seven days lockdown. But then this was followed by a longer uh, lockdown uh, in Baguio. So there were students that were really stranded in the city of Baguio and couldn't go home because there was no transportation. And these were the students having stress and uh, anxieties. No? And we had to address this, especially that we are a Catholic school, we are a Catholic institution, we had to address these problems. And so webinars on mental health and also help desks were organized in order to address the problems of stress, anxiety, attempted suicide, suicides no, among our students. I think these are the challenges that we have faced during the first days and we continue to face until now uh, during this pandemic. Thank you, uh, Father Gilbert. I think uh, uh, folks, you have just seen how we move from a global perspective then to a more regional ASEAN perspective and then a Philippine perspective. I think uh, that makes for a very good uh, start for this conversation. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask our distinguished panelists. Uh, I uh, gathered four important challenges during COVID-19 and how they are impacting on uh, education as um, a public uh, service. So the first one uh, was mentioned, the first two rather were uh, emphasized by Dr. Hill and these are access and then there's pedagogy and methodology. The third is about managing information which was shared by um, uh, our friend from uh, Indonesia, uh, Dr. Sanjaya and uh, Father Gilbert reiterated some of these items and also included mental health. Can I ask our uh, panelists, which of these four do you think will likely take a different shape or a different focus in the post-pandemic context? Is it going to be more of access, pedagogy, methodology, the management of information and truth, and mental health or mental well-being? Let's uh, begin with uh, this time, uh, uh, beginning with... Uh, uh, Father Gilbert, Father Gilbert. I, I, for me, I think it's pedagogy. No, uh, uh, post pandemic, I was thinking since we have already started using online based learning and correspondence based learning, since these were new 
no, to our students and also to our teachers. Why don't we not continue using them post-pandemic? No, I think uh, uh, these are very good lessons that it has brought us. These are positive elements that uh, I think this pandemic has contributed to our educational system because I think it has sped us you know, towards <laughs> using online and also correspondence-based learning. Then our right. reach you know, to, to, I think, to our uh, um, constituents is more than uh, before you know, when uh, everything was classroom-based. So right. I think pedagogy will have really a, a new way of uh, doing things in the future. Uh, Father, uh, on a related note, uh, would you think that there are more students, parents, and faculty members now attending even our online Eucharistic celebrations? <laughs> very true, very true. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, my experience here, when, uh, when uh, we had the face-to-face, there were very few attending our daily masses. But now mm -hmm. I'm averaging 60 to 70 attendance in the masses every day. No, okay. which, you never <laughs> did, which you never did on a face-to-face -face basis. Okay, that, that's great to hear, Father. So for Father, it's about uh, the pedagogy or methodology or the, the, the delivery of instruction. Let's now move on to uh, Dr. Sanjaya. Uh, which of the four do you think will likely change uh, further? Is yeah. it access, pedagogy, management of truth and information, or mental wellness? Yeah, I agree with uh, Father Gilbert. Pedagogy is, uh, is the important thing for the post-pandemic because we cannot go backward. We cannot go the previous uh, activity like before pandemic. Some of problems become normal now. Uh, sometimes we have problem in the access, but we know, now we, we know how to handle it. Not because we have the access, but we, we can handle, not in panic anymore. And also, also the problem with the information now become normal. Everybody knows that uh, this is the changing situation. So the last thing is pedagogy how to deliver the the knowledge to the to the student in uh, using the online online mode several so students already said to me that they prefer to continue online uh, learning yeah uh, compared to the offline but uh, most of the bachelor student uh, prefer for the offline learning but most of the uh, uh, master and, and doctorate program, they prefer uh, doing online learning. Mm -hmm. So right. pedagogy is uh, maybe is uh, more important. Okay, thank you. And uh, we move on to Dr. Hill. And after Dr. Hill, I'll introduce uh, the other person uh, who will be completing our panel. And I think uh, has just arrived in time for us to and to, for him to answer one important question. So, Green, I'll get back to you in a little while. Dr. Hill, please go ahead. Well, as my uh, fellow panelists have already said, I think um, uh, I, and I agree fully with what uh, Father Gilbert and Dr. Sanjay have argued uh, regarding the importance of um, online and the impact it will have on, on our mode of teaching. But I think we should look at also at those four items. Um, as very different in the sense that we have two uh, that will lead to the blossoming of the institutions when it comes to, well, what we were just saying, using the online platforms and new pedagogy. It's a, an opportunity for a transformation and for innovation and for uh, uh, leading the university into a new paradigm. And then the other two issues will also stay with us and they may, uh, they are certainly a liability that we have to tackle. Uh, the issues of mental health, the 
problems with social distancing if we don't go as far as uh, to deal with the 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 the, the, um, the issues that uh, father gilbert mentioned the anxiety and and the um, um the suicidal tendencies in many of our students who feel completely alone but even our practices social distancing will take a toll on the way we interact we are not wired to be distant from each yeah. other we are wired to be to socialize to interact to be together emotionally so i think we must pay attention to also how this will bring about a behavioral transformation that may have a strong impact on how we deal with each other as humans and how we impact our uh, communities. Um, and the issue of information is an, a, is extremely uh, relevant for universities. Yeah. There is clearly a crisis of truth and science that has been uh, exploding all over the globe by dint of um, the level of uh, fake uh, narratives that circulate mm -hmm. and the easy access that students have to these narratives online. Um, and institutions, universities and colleges need to act as brokers in these narratives, uh, mm -hmm. uh, providing the, the students with the necessary tools to be able to select and choose between what is true, what is uh, um, what is valuable information out there, and what is fake? Wow, very well said. So, uh, capping this first uh, segment of our conversation on what has changed and what will likely still change, given the pandemic, is um, uh, a specialist in philosophy, politics, and economics, having finished degrees at Trinity College in Oxford and has been working in the field of education research and management since 1995. After six years leading AIM Higher work in London, he founded and now leads both Access Higher Education and the National Education Opportunities Network in the United Kingdom. Uh, he holds visiting professorships at Amity University, London and Sunway University, Kuala Lumpur. He is a member of the board of the National Union of Students and US and has produced over 200 conference papers and publications. And uh, we attribute to him the celebration of the World Access to Higher Education Day. So this time we'll hear from Dr. Graham Atherton on what he thinks with, uh, is the most significant challenge that any mission-driven educational institution faces because of the pandemic, Graham? Thank you, Ed, and, and apologies to colleagues for arriving a little bit late. Uh, as, uh, as Ed said, it's World Access to Education Day today, and we have um, six events going on across the world today. Uh, we've had two already, uh, one in Australasia and one in Asia itself, hosted by the Asia Europe Foundation, and, uh, and also there's one actually happening a moment in Africa, so things ran into each other a little bit. But I'm really, I'm really happy to be here. I really thank you very much for this wonderful invitation uh, to be part of your event today and, and to explore with you the mission-driven nature of how education challenges. And I, I came in there at the end of, of, of the presentations, of uh, the, the comments there, from previous speakers, a compliment Father Gilbert on his Christmas tree as well in the background there. That's a fantastic <laughs> thing to see, Father Gilbert. We're getting our decorations out as well, Father Gilbert. We're in the UK at the moment, so uh, it's a wonderful <laughs> to see that one. Uh, we'll back onto the points at hand. Um, I, I think, as um, the doctors have well stated, I think that, that the four issues that you discussed are very much interlinked. Um, to see one overall as, as, as one dominant challenge would be difficult. Um, I think obviously I come to this from an access perspective. Um, I think pedagogically speaking, um, yes, um, we have seen a, a huge shift to online learning, of course, by necessity, and that has bred some innovation. Um, we've just done a piece of research, for instance, that looks at the response to the pandemic uh, in terms of supporting access to higher education for learners from low income and marginalised backgrounds in 45 countries across the world and, and across those 45 countries that we, we surveyed or we had responses from for our survey, uh, in virtually all instances, of course, they're moving to online learning. Yet at the same time, the, the, the ability of that online learning to, to, to take forward the mission of particular institutions is, of course, something that is really in its infancy. 
Uh, and we're into a period of a post pandemic of huge uncertainty. I mean, we talk about there being changes that will not, um, we won't go back to the, the way things were before, that we'll continue with certain changes in pedagogy. Well, I believe we will, but at the same time, when you see uh, episodes like this uh, globally or, or things happening like this, where you have um, uh, people or communities, countries forced in particular situations, when they're able to go back to other situations, it's going to be a bounce back. You couldn't, you couldn't rule out the being a bounce back to physical. The fact we have to, we haven't been able to have physical, as Dr. Isabel said, you know, we, we, the, the physical is something that we only realise we miss when it's not there. And you've seen sometimes that there could be really a reverse back to the need for face-to-face teaching. You, you couldn't rule that out in terms of how you, and then how you take your mission forward in that context is, is, is something that's an, an institutional management challenge as well. I mean, it, it, just to relate in, in terms of, um, of the previous event I was at this morning, uh, the, the Asia leg of, uh, well, that's the Trial Education Day, the final speaker spoke about values as well. Uh, what does COVID tell us about the need for values in higher education? Is it a moment for us to reflect upon the values of what we are trying to do? Um, I mean, we've t- a lot of focus, particularly in, in my part of the world, uh, obviously in the UK. Also, we, we have an Anglo model, if you like, of higher education. We, we don't look towards Europe much in the UK, as much as we look towards places like the US. And we've gone very much down a human capital model in the UK, where the value of higher education is very much perceived by policymakers in our country uh, in terms of labour market and employment value. That's clearly a crucial element of, of higher education and why people are to education. But in the sense of doing that, I think we, we lost the focus really on the, the social value of higher education, mm. the broader benefits of higher education. I think particularly picking up again on Dr. Isabel's points, I mean, the value of higher education should be in, in order to support students to make their way through an information intense world where there are pressures which lead one to, to actually lose control of knowledge and information uh, but we lost sight of that a bit i think in the uk for sure uh, and whether that, that's happened in other countries I, I, i'm not so qualified to say on that point i know more about who's participating in higher education across the world less about the values of those systems but possibly i think that this moment of looking at value is a moment where mission led higher education actually possibly could come into its own in that regard but um, I think it's a, it, it's this uncertain time, and and I, I'm always wary about making these huge predictions. I'm wary about yes, I think there'll be greater online learning, but I do wonder whether there'll be a bounce back, whether people are going to want to go back to physically. You see this I mean, in our country at the moment. You've got students attending higher education in the first term, well, because we're very much in it at the moment in the UK. We're in, we're in a national lockdown, so you've got students there who literally have been in their halls for like two months, literally not allowed to leave. Literally, mm. are you almost in a prison-like situation? Now, you're not telling me that at that point in their lives, young people at the point in their lives, when they're allowed to mix again, they will be mixing again with a vengeance. I can almost guarantee it. <laughs> so they'll want to actually do anything that isn't online. Ooh, yeah. so. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Green, for uh, those wonderful insights. And... Um, I think uh, what we have gathered from the first half of our conversation is that our panelists are very mindful of the fact that at an institutional level, they have particular responses, especially in providing for the needs of various constituencies within the higher education system. And that's very good. But we also have to be mindful how the entire global ecosystem of higher education institutions are eating either coming together, competing with each other, or whatnot. So that's why this conversation is entitled Critiquing Crisis Response. So uh, at this juncture, I'd like to transition to our next big uh, discussion point, which will be uh, some form of assessment from our distinguished resource persons. Do you think there's some indication that Uh, higher education institutions in general and mission-driven and Catholic higher education institutions in particular had some degree of unity, coordination, or at the very least, 
uh, some forms of commonality in terms of responding to the situation. I think given the backgrounds of our uh, network representatives here, you'd be able to cite some of these uh, uh, collaborations or networking initiatives that have led to something that is useful in the, our current uh, context. So uh, maybe we could hear from uh, uh, Dr. Isabel Hill, who's working with the International Federation of Catholic Universities first. And then we'll move on to uh, Graeme, who has been working with a lot of these networks uh, recently. Dr. Hill, please. So let me start very briefly by saying no unity, some coordination, lots of commonalities. Um, <laughs> So th the thing is, uh, most of the responses have, uh, as I said earlier, been driven by context, right? And the contexts have varied widely. The pandemic has spread uh, unevenly, though it affects us all the same way. You know, it has um, uh, spread unevenly uh, across the globe. Um, now, as so the commonalities are there, what we've just shared uh, about the challenges, uh, the opportunities that higher education institutions face uh, with the local twist, but they're also global in scope. Um, so what I would say, what I miss, what we have tried to do at the International Federation um, and uh, what we have missed in the initial stages is a stronger global coordination. Um, it, it, the pandemic, we had to move from uh, in-presence learning to remote over 24 hours. And I, I think this came uh, unexpectedly for most institutions, unaware of the fact whether you were invested in the, uh, the COVID research, uh, whether your uh, medical schools, your health sciences institutes were working with the public authorities or uh, privately uh, for uh, the development of vaccines and, and other tools. Uh, the change came unexpectedly. It was brutal. Um, and it, uh, uh, university presidents were faced with the need to react to leads. This is a this is a moment to test leadership, to lead in these hazardous situation, be able to uh, take charge, uh, make decisions, and uh, in in this, um, sure enough. Um, Hearing about the experiences of others uh, was naturally important, but you had to decide uh, at the moment uh, in this absolutely risky situation. So coordination came already as institutions were um, dealing and were implementing their own um, uh, measures. Um, and, and I would like to single out two um, situations, uh, one of them, uh, which was driven by IFCU, uh, and these were the um, training uh, sessions uh, for uh, faculty uh, on pedagogy and technology and on uh, leadership adapting to, to COVID. Uh, and as IFCU, I know that other um, uh, association, university associations did the same. Uh, there were a number of events, Zoom, Teams, and you name it, across the globe um, of sharing experiences uh, amongst university leaders and not only leaders, I mean, those who were invested in governance and uh, faculty members. We've all been participating in those kinds of events and the uh, amount of information we get from the experience of our colleagues is truly impactful to our work. Um, and uh, um, a third uh, level that I would like to also um, mention um, is work that occurred within uh, the uh, within SACRO. SACRO is an alliance called the Strategic Alliance of Catholic Research Universities that was founded um, two years, uh, three years ago. Uh, and it brings together eight uh, universities from, so three European universities, one in the United States, Boston College, ACU, 
in Australia, Sofia University in Japan, and two universities in Latin America, in Chile and Brazil. Um, it brings my own institution is, is uh, um, in in this uh, league, let's say. And one of the things that these uh, it, it doesn't work with a lot of institutions, but since this is a a group of eight. Uh, universities, one of the things we did was to coordinate uh, in uh, some of the research, the large research projects on COVID. Uh, for instance, many of us are cooperating in the trials uh, for the vaccines, um, uh, for the AstraZeneca, and also for the uh, Pfizer trials. And uh, we've had uh, researchers uh, working together on um, uh, response, not, not only on the on the science of COVID um, and on tackling um, um, medicine to, to uh, deal with the pandemic, but also on uh, social impact and uh, uh, dealing with um, uh, and devising public health measures, so in, in an advisory uh, capacity. So these three dimensions, on the one hand, raising awareness, training, this is something that higher education institutions can do. Um, the experiences, sharing, um, and then collaborating in the science, uh, they have worked not uh, at the phase one, of the pandemic, but in the second one, because initially we all had to make decisions as the event was occurring. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hill. And I think um, the uh, sample collaborations that you've mentioned matter a lot in terms of showing how capable Catholic higher education institutions uh, uh, in terms of responding to specific aspects of the pandemic and what more if we're actually able to uh, create more of these structures as we continue uh, facing the challenges brought about by this uh, crisis. Now, over to you, uh, Dr. Atherton, for your perspective, please. Thank you, Ed. Um, I, mean, I, I can comment less specifically, and like Dr. Gill, on the, on the Catholic collaboration scenario situations, but I can talk about collaboration overall. I mean, I think in terms of World Access to Education Day we're having today, I mean, I think the ability, I think this is common to what we've seen in, in uh, work we've done in Europe and in our country as well. The, the common nature of the challenge, obviously context specific nature, but the commonalities in the challenge has led people to want to talk about the issue, to converse and dialogue. Mm -hmm. I think mean, alongside, you know, the shift to remote working, making such dialogue actually more feasible. We, we've certainly, in the events that we've, for instance, done, uh, in uh, our country, a little bit like I think uh, Father Gilbert said earlier on about the great numbers of people taking part in his in his in his sermons, etc. We've had greater participants and greater range of participants in, in dialogues we've had. So, for instance, in World Access Day today, we have over thirteen hundred uh, delegates from one hundred and seven countries participating in our six editions to six events today. Now, that level of, of commonality and dialogue wasn't happening before. That doesn't necessarily mean coordination; it means it means dialogue. And it's happened in, in home as well. You know, the, the things that we've done, we focus very much here in the UK in our work on supporting access to education for those from low income and marginalised backgrounds. Those who are far less likely to go to higher education when they go to higher education, which greater challenges. Now, it's a very important policy issue in, in the UK, but we still have much greater interest in, in the issue. We've had greater dialogue across the sector, more universities and of different natures, Catholic, non-Catholic, etc. Uh, well, that doesn't necessarily lead to coordination. It just means dialogue. Um, I think it's shown possibly that the, the role of coordination, the role of organisations who sit in that space to, to facilitate dialogue and potential collaboration uh, as potentially a more important role. So you've seen networks that we work with being much more busier, being, being uh, their role being enhanced because that they sit in a space where they allow this to occur. However, I think going forward, you, you'll also see challenges for, for dialogue and coordination because the problem also is, is you see what the focuses are. Sustainability, financial sustainability is a huge concern for institutions across the world. Uh, you've seen the data on, on the, the economic cost to higher education of, of the pandemic and leaders grappling with how they can make their institutions continue to be sustainable 
when, of course, governments are also under economic pressures, thus aren't necessarily positioned always to bail them out and support them. Now, what that means, of course, is for, the, for global coordination and global dialogue is that this thing doesn't happen on its own. There's sometimes an assumption, I think, that when you, 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 have, you think about coordination and dialogue and common responses, that if there's a problem, people will just come together and, and they, will sort of, they will form these commonalities. It doesn't happen like that. Somebody has to sit in that space that, that facilitates that, be that organisations like Dr. Be that things like Y, be other forms of, of networks that many of us are members of. However, those networks will have faced their own challenges because those networks generally survive on the subscriptions from their members. And already, for instance, at home, what universities in the UK do, university leaders, when economic times are hard, they look at the list of things they're members of and they cut down possibly half of those memberships because it's the easiest way of saving money without laying off you know, faculty members or laying off staff. So for your, for your organisation to sit in this space of, of creating dialogue, and that, uh, whilst at one point being, you know, as we, it's a phrase we describe in the UK, flavour of the month, but being you know, the things that everybody wants to be part of, yet at the same time, also, they know in the back of their minds, those people who lead and, and take these organisations forward, that, that when it comes to very soon and it comes to actually being, them being sustainable, that while on the one hand, universities want to take part in them, on the other hand, they're pressured when it comes to making their contribution that allow these dialogues to happen. Because again, I, I think it's absolutely crucial uh, that we have these communication of these dialogues because the, no, the COVID again has, has brought to the fore that we face as as a planet, global challenges. They need to be formed with global solutions or global, global ways of, of dealing with that. But there has to be a glue in the middle, a glue that makes those coordinate, those communications happen. And of course, the big worry is for those involved in that, like Dr. Hill is and, and, and Dr. Gillis, and I am in my own country, my own networks. Will I be able to keep it, these things sustainable year on year as my members in the UK particularly look at the pressures that our system is facing? Thank you, uh, uh, Grim, about that uh, insightful uh, sharing. And I think uh, now more than ever, the power of dialogue with other like-minded individuals and agencies really matter in our attempt to understand further how higher education will be shaped uh, further. Uh, this time, we'll look at a more uh, uh, regional and local perspective. Uh, I'll begin by asking uh, Dr. Sanjaya to give us his uh, insights and then the last to speak is going to be Father Gilbert. But before you, uh, Dr. Sanjaya gives his uh, input, um, there are some participants who are already making use of our Q&A panel and Dr. Hill has actually started uh, replying to them and maybe the other uh, panelists would also want to chime in. But for those of you who would like to interact with our uh, panelists, please use the electronic raise hand tool. And later during our interactive uh, segment, I will promote you to become a member of the panel and articulate your thoughts with any of our four speakers. So, uh, Dr. Sanjaya, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ed. Uh, if you ask about the unity in our institution, yeah, between our institution, yeah, in the beginning, we can say no, no unity. Because uh, at that situation, we were in chaotic situation and the survival instinct was increased. But uh, then after the condition already okay, the feelings of empathy take over. Yeah. Our institution also uh, involved uh, to discuss uh, about the pandemic situation, how to solve and also uh, doing workshop for many school to adapt the information technology and also we we create uh, some some action for the uh, hospital for the uh, people to to get uh, the better treatment for the for the health in in the pandemic situation yeah even though even though some institution have different uh, situation but uh, we, we don't know exactly the, the problem of each institution, but we have to do what we can do. We also have the senior professor, we also have students in the remote areas, but uh, 
at that moment we we also create some uh, policy that even though we do better for the for the people we do better for the student but we cannot expect uh, in the highest uh, criteria so we we do we do what uh, what the situ- uh, we do exactly equal with the situation because the situation is not a perfect so don't expect the perfect one but we do uh, the collaboration we do the cooperation we do discussion between institutions so now we also uh, still helping the school to to get to know how to teach using the current pedagogy for for the for the online learning and the strategy if the problem face differently yeah if they they face the problem differently how to how to implement the strategy so the student not get stress so the uh, the the lecturer the, uh, the teacher not get uh, angry so that we what we can do for the for the community and not only our institution but several institution in in catholic higher education also did the same in in different areas in different region what they can do now is better compared to the uh, in the beginning situation yes the beginning situation we cannot say uh, we already good and then we can have empathy no at that situation everyone feel how to survive but now it's okay we 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 can give our uh, what what we can do for the uh, for the for the community that's all all right thank you uh, dr sanjaya and uh, now we listen to father gilbert who i think uh, from the start uh, of the experience of lockdowns in the philippines actually um, he led some form of um, mobilization of people to reach out come together and uh, work towards uh, something um, common. So uh, Father Gilbert, uh, care to share some of the experiences or initiatives that uh, you and your institution have led? Father Gilbert, you're on mute. If you could just unmute your microphone, please. I am very happy to report to you that in the Philippines, among our Catholic educational institutions, we have started dialoguing and talking, actually. And there are two areas that we have uh, identified where we can come together and work together. And that is a consortium, and the other one is an open educational resources. So in the consortium, we said that we, as a Catholic higher education institution members, uh, can come together and share our resources and programs. And the areas that we have identified are the module development, second, faculty training and flexible learning, development of virtual internship programs, research and extension, development of learning management systems, and faculty exchange. So among us, Catholic higher education, we can easily do this. So the other area where we, we, we identified as a place where we can really help one another is Open Educational Resources, or OER. Now, these are teaching and learning research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in a public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, adapt, adaptation and redistribution by others with no or limited restriction. So uh, there has been activities already going on so that this area can also come to fruition. We have surveyed already CHEI's availability of OERs. We have surveys on willingness of our Catholic higher education institutions to share their uh, online educational resources. 
And then we have also, we are going to inventory uh, the learning resources available, uh, academic, syllabi, or learning modules. So these are places. But as an institution, uh, St. Louis University, after training our teachers here in the institution, in the, in the university, we also reach out to our Catholic schools in the region. So we have been training about 2,000 teachers on online-based learning and correspondence learning. So with these trainings, they were able to, you know, at least get a professional training you know, from, from our university training team. So these are uh, collaborative efforts that has been going on among our Catholic higher education institutions. No? It is still going on, discussions are going on, dialogues are going on, and I hope that uh, in the end we, we can come up with uh, a real collaborative project among us uh, Catholic higher education institutions in the Philippines. Well, I love the I love the energy uh, being demonstrated uh, fa by Father Gilbert, and I think uh, it's uh, echoing the kind of vision that our other distinguished uh, experts uh, are seeing, uh, as will likely happen uh, as we continue in this uh, journey. But uh, you see, uh, the fact of the matter is, prior to COVID nineteen, there had been a lot of initiatives or areas or projects where higher education institutions form consortia, networks, um, and the like. But eventually, uh, they slow down in terms of keeping the momentum of working together. And on this note, I'd like to ask any one of our four panelists, what a practical tip can you give uh, to those people intending to come together or have already started working together at this time, how do you sustain, to borrow the words of agreeing, the dialogue, the coordination, the collaboration? What will be, what do you think will be key to sustaining such kind of uh, uh, coordination? Um, anyone would like to begin? Um, um, okay, maybe I, I'd call on uh, people so that they could uh, come in sequence. So. Uh, let's start uh, with Green, followed by Dr. Hill, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Father Gilbert, and then Dr. Sanjaya. Uh, Dr. Green, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I think, you know, sustaining that dialogue is very difficult and challenging. And I think that if you're going to come together and do these things, then um, there has to be clear rationale for, for why you would do this. Uh, there has to be a realistic set. Of, of goals going forward. I think when you have that, if you want a sustainable dialogue, it's okay having the first conversation because there's something, there's, there's an issue, a problem you can talk about, but and then you have that enthusiasm or, or, or that need to, to, to bring together, to look at an issue. It's how you take it forward after that. That's the challenge, be mm -hmm. particularly in a resource challenged environment. Um, I think clearly you, you think about the space in which we work. I mean, if you think about, how education is a sector as opposed to other parts of, of society or the economy. It, it's based upon knowledge. It's based upon information. It's based upon research and data. And I think there's a lot to be said for, for always thinking about how you take your understanding forward in, 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 in these areas, uh, all areas of our practice. Uh, if you could, again, contrasting it to other areas, research intensives, they're parts of the private sector, but they are, they are in universities and education. If you want to shift things, you're talking about new things or move policy or move practice. You're looking at a, a, a part of, of a group of people within education across the world who respond to evidence. I mean, again, we talked, Dr. Gill talked before about that real importance across society of, of fake news and fake information. Mm -hmm. But within education, we, st we still have that, 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 that affinity to knowledge. So how one as a grouping develops new knowledge and new insights will become what sustain that conversation, I would say. Thank you, Graham, and um, wonderful input. Said uh, Dr. Hill, how about you? And in terms of your rich experience uh, working with a lot of Catholic higher education institutions, uh, uh, I would like to follow on what uh, Graham has said um, and to uh, stress the the issue 
of uh, how important these networks are to um, sustain the credibility of the institution. So what, one of the things that has been most deeply affected is basically this notion of there's a crisis of trust in, in the way to, uh, that institutions and uh, universities have responded, how they have um, supported their students. And this is clearly, clearly critical dimension. Uh, they're, uh, one of um, the big uh, claims and the, the big grievances of students is how in many situations they have felt abandoned by their institutions. And so I think that this, this crisis of trust, not only we were talking about science and, and, and the narratives, but also in the way we deal with our, we, we support our, our, uh, our communities, our students, which is uh, also the issue that uh, Father Gilbert started uh, talking to us about. And uh, the second uh, element is um, that sustaining this requires predictability and you need to be, it's not a one-off thing. It's not a one-off mm. seminar where you discuss individually or a group of people discuss um, their experiences and then you go off into your world and deal with real life. No, I mean, if, if the cooperation is to be effective, it has to be predictable, regular, and you need to feel that you truly have a support system in your peers. Mm -hmm. Um, I like that uh, uh, very uh, forceful argument on the uh, the discourse of uh, engagement premise on truth and how this is going to define further our individual and collective identities as uh, people engaged in higher education, uh, Catholic higher education. Thank you. Um, now maybe we could call on uh, Doc, uh, Father Gilbert and then after Father Gilbert, we'll have Dr. Sanjaya. Father Gilbert. Uh, Father Gilbert, there you go. Okay. Um, I, I totally agree with uh, uh, Dr. Jill and Dr. Graham, but uh, on top of that, uh, let me add also leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we are very lucky in the Philippines because we have SEAP uh, and uh, we have visionaries in SEAP like Dr. Ed Fermin or no? uh, Father, Father Jobert no? uh, in NHEC, Sister Marisa Biri, our president pushing us always you know, to, to conduct the meetings and to go on you know, with, with our plans. You know? And I think that is very important to sustain the, uh, the, the coordination and also the meetings that are going on. You now, without this, I think, uh, well, we will, we will all be lazy you know, attending meetings because there are so many, there are so many meetings. I think uh, the Zoom has allowed us to attend so many meetings no, in, in a day or in a week. No? But then that there are leaders who inspire us and also to let us go on meeting no, and uh, achieve our goals. That's very important. Okay, great, uh, Father Gilbert. And uh, again, kudos to the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines because uh, we continue to have these regular dialogues or conversations on what we can do at the institutional and of course at the association uh, levels. And finally, Dr. Uh, Sanjaya, please. Yeah, because our speaker already explained completely, I just add uh, one more, is about uh, leadership support because uh, if we cannot uh, gather together, yeah, hand together, so we cannot sustain the, the coordination between the, uh, the institution. So if the program is system systematically already programmed in the, in, the in, the, in the coordination, so it will be, yeah, it will be easily to, to implement a uh, sustain in the next period or in the next term. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanjaya. I think uh, the variety of perspectives that we're seeing right now is very enriching. And this goes to show that we are never alone in this uh, journey towards uh, recovery. And I think that it matters that we should be starting to pick up the lessons of how to, uh, again, uh, create that uh, culture of trusting each other 
talking with each other in order to uh, create more solid uh, solutions and mechanisms of helping out the entire ecosystem. So we're now ready to accommodate a few questions and um, moments of interaction with our audience. And I'm going to begin by allowing uh, Maria Salvacion Abelia to actually uh, unmute her microphone and uh, articulate her thoughts. Uh, Professor Abelia, please introduce yourself, your institution, and go ahead and ask your question. I'd request that you make mention of the particular speaker that you would like to interact with. Professor Abelia, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Professor Abelia. Your microphone has been unmuted, so please go ahead. Uh, I think uh, Professor Abelia can hear us, but is unable to uh, speak. Um, okay, Professor Abelia, if you don't mind, um, I'll share with them the query that you have uh, posed. And this is, uh, how can institutions improve or guarantee the competence of the graduates who are going to be uh, products of this COVID-19 scenario? So I think that's a very good question. We're asking about the quality of the graduates that we will be producing given the limitations and restrictions of our current time. So uh, would any one of our uh, four speakers like to begin? Uh, yes, uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Father Gilbert, and then uh, Dr. Hill raised her hand. Uh, sorry, did I hear you, Father Gilbert, or is it Dr. Hill? Okay, Dr. Hill, go ahead, please. I think it was then Dr. Sanjaya. After Sanjaya. Dr. Hill, it's Dr. Ah, first. okay, Dr. Sanjaya after. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Sanjaya, and then after you will be Dr. Hill. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ed, uh, it, this is good question and hard question. And uh, several parents already asked to me as a rector how to guarantee uh, their child, their kid uh, as a good, graduation after after the pandemic uh, we can we can say it's not easy for the vocational uh, education but for non vocational education we we have several tools yeah mm -hmm. several evaluation that we can provide this is uh, accurate even though we have to change the 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 world to be the virtual world but for the vocational uh, education we should add more tools then, but uh, we don't have now in this current situation, it's uh, like a, a infestation in the future, not now. But for the non-vocational, we, we can say that we can, we can uh, guarantee now because the evaluation and all infrastructure already prepared. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hill? Well, I think we have to uh, put the burden uh, on us um, and, <laughs> one of the, right? and uh, not on context and basically uh, allow, you know, th this, I think it was uh, Dr. Sanjay who spoke about this, that there is clearly perception that uh, online learning is second level vis-a-vis -vis, mm -hmm. uh, in-presence learning. So this, this notion of how you evaluate or how you assess the value of er your education. Um, what we have make, to make clear to students is that our commitment to the excellence of their training is the same, be it online, or uh, in presence and to adapt our teaching and our methodologies so that we can achieve that goal. Um, for instance, I, I will tell you, uh, um, just share an example from my own institution. Uh, during the first wave of COVID, um, students in medicine and in the health sciences were um, prohibited from having their internships at hospitals because of infection. So you were talking first, second year uh, uh, students in dentistry, uh, medicine, and so on. Uh, of course, as in this type of uh, uh, training, you have the academics, the research side, and the clinical. And the clinical was, of course, being challenged by, by, by the situation because uh, the hospitals didn't want to take into their responsibility 
what would happen if the students would be uh, infected or infect patients further patients in that situation, right? Um, so what we did was we created a special program for them and they took during the summer. So basically their term did not end in May as it usually is in, in uh, the uh, our end of the world, but uh, in mid August. So that after the pandemic, we could extend, uh, they could take the, the, the clinical um, uh, sessions in mm -hmm. the hospitals post uh, the end of term. So the importance, this is just an example, but it is to show that it is on institutions to um, foster uh, resilience and trust in our students so that they themselves don't feel that they are victims of the situation, but that they are champions of a very mm -hmm. complex moment. Wow, well said. And uh, to uh, probably further add to this ongoing conversation on how we guarantee student success, uh, Dr. Atherton actually has been working on a lot of research on student access and success. Maybe uh, Dr. Atherton can give us uh, insight into what will be some conditions that will enable our students to really succeed given the current uh, context. Uh, Dr. Graham? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that uh, building on Dr. Gill's points, I, I think you know, innovation and flexibility within what we deliver is crucial. Um, I mean, I think that the points I made earlier on, I think I mean, points in the last presentation about if the student success, I think enabling the difference between physical and social distancing is important. I mean, what came up in, uh, it's came up in the research we've just produced recently to release this week is one of the respondents of our global survey was speaking about the difference between physical and social distancing, for instance, is an important concept. We have to try and for, keep, continue to foster belonging among students. Mm -hmm. I mean, physical distancing means not being close to each other. We can still try and create the social bonds. They're really important if we're going to give the platform for students to achieve their potential. As much as innovation and flexibility we need to be, there are huge challenges these students face at the moment. Uh, we need in, in, in higher education, within institutions, to really try and foster that sense of, of belonging. Uh, and in that as well, to, to give the platform for students to, to, to achieve their potential. But in doing that, I think it's, it's crucial that we, we try and challenge some of the things that we're doing. But at the same time, remembering the challenge that places upon staff. Uh, I think, you know, student success is dependent upon staff success, if you like, on staff being able to, uh, to be able to, 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 to perform at their potential. Um, and I think, you know, in that this discussion as well, uh, we have to be careful that, you know, the feedback we get, for instance, from the work we've done, not just in the UK, that many staff are working exceptionally even harder now in the virtual space than they were before, mm -hmm. you know, support their students. And, and, and again, the burdens they're facing, uh, if they become overburdened, they become overstressed, and that, that will um, restrict the ability of students to achieve their potential. I mean, to, to the question, you know, in terms of, of, uh, of how we can both ensure that students aren't, uh, are coming out with the appropriate skills, I mean, context subjects differ. Uh, I mean, there has to be a, a very subject based approach to this. Again, it's about supporting staff. If you think about institutionally, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. I mean, how you deliver, I think Dr. Gill's example was, was an excellent one in terms of how different students, different courses require a level of in-industry or, if you like, experience. Or, I mean, another one that, again, another example, I mean, use, Dr. Gill used a medical example. One challenge that we're seeing at the moment, for instance, uh, within my London-based network, actually, here, is many of our member institutions uh, are teacher training institutions. And in the, in the in teacher training, as well as having, of course, uh, content delivery, what's really important is you go out there and you do your placements in schools uh, where you actually develop those pedagogical skills that allow you to, to go on to teach. Now, it's really difficult to do at the moment because schools, because of regulations, aren't allowing students, anybody who isn't a full-time staff member into the school. They can't say students to do placements at the moment. So again, it's, it really then means that how can we be innovative? How can we have virtual uh, experiences somehow, somehow can, can bring that teaching experience to, uh, to our students? 
But it is the messages we give out, and messages, I think, about the value of what's happening at the moment. Just come just from university, also finally, I'd like to say, from government. Uh, because, I think, again, what, what was interesting uh, in the survey we recently produced was, which is coming out again this week as part of WAHED, was the, the mixed responses by governments to mm. supporting students and higher education through the pandemic. Uh, not just in terms of financial support for students and institutions, but also in terms of emphasising in the public discourse the value of students in higher education. That we unfortunately in, in here, well, not in the UK, in England, you know, we have four nations in the UK, in Scotland and Wales, their governments are giving strong messages out about the value of students. In England, it's not happening. It's not happening at the moment. Uh, and it's not in these institutions. And okay, so one thing not liking universities or thinking that we in universities are, are some sort of culture war problem, but uh, I think. For students, it, it, it really gets to the public the idea that they're not of value. And I hope that's not happening across too many other countries, but we're having it in England. Thank you, Graeme. Uh, Father Gilbert, uh, are you adding something to this or shall I call on the next? Uh... Okay, um, go ahead, Father. When we formulated our roadmap, you know, at the end of the roadmap, uh, which was the fourth stage was uh, QA, you know, quality assurance. I think this is very important because then we need to monitor and evaluate you know, the, the, the classes that are going online. You know? And then uh, when you monitor and evaluate and suggest for improvement, you know, I think there is quality that is delivered to the students. You know? And uh, then they will feel that they're really exerting effort. Although, you know, as uh, Dr. Gale and uh, Dr. Graham was saying early on, uh, this is really double work for our faculty you know, and for administration. They're really working very hard, but then um, uh, this is also an assurance to our students that we're giving them quality education. Well said, thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, we move on to the next uh, live uh, question that will be given by our colleague, Dr. Maria Lutgaria Manuela Punay. Ma'am, please introduce yourself in your institution and go ahead and articulate your question. If you could please identify the person or panelist you'd like uh, to answer your question, that would be highly appreciated. Dr. Punay, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Fermin. Um, I am Dr. Maria Lutgarda Manuela Punay from Shana College of Taytay. And um, anybody from the panelists uh, can answer this. I, actually, I have three concerns. Um, first, um, with regards to the quality of education, especially for the bachelor's uh, courses that require laboratory activities, we are, uh, in our institution, we delayed those, those um, laboratory activities and we're thinking that for the coming SEM or the next school year, we will be able to uh, provide them that by maybe by following the protocol uh, and providing them uh, enough space for the social distancing. But the concern there is who will be the responsible uh, or whose responsibility if in case there will still be um, cases of, of uh, COVID in spite of all the protocols, the, the wearing of the mask, the social distancing. Um, who will be responsible for that? And uh, the next is we notice that our students are more vulnerable, more sensitive, and easily stressed even though we um, we are very responsive to their needs and because of this being responsive there is this tendency uh, that they are being pampered and some of our faculty members are worried that they might not be that disciplined anymore and that's the next concern uh, during online classes, uh, how can we instill discipline to our students in terms of for them being honest 
being focused on their lessons and being attentive or attuned to develop self-time management. Because uh, during online classes, they have the tendency to excuse themselves to not turn on their cameras because of the bandwidth that it will consume. So uh, for in the end of the faculty members, they're kind of worried if, if that particular student is really listening or or is really focused on the study. Okay. Uh, Dr. Punay, um, yes. did we get your question um, uh, right? You're, you're asking about uh, whose responsibility will it be the moment yes. uh, something happens to the students? Yes, and I think this, the second one has something to do with uh, how we teach respons responsibility among our students. Is that what you wanted to say? The next, uh, the, the second one is um, how can we be responsive to our students since uh -huh. they are very vulnerable and sensitive and easily stressed without really pampering them and taking away the, the discipline? Okay, so I think uh, that's uh, clear enough. Um, would you like to call on uh, anyone in particular? Can we have Father Salas? Okay, uh, Father Gilbert. Um, Okay. For the first question, uh, lately IATF issued a uh, guideline uh, for assuming classes, and it is very stringent. No, it should be that there are 28 days without COVID no, in a particular area before you can start classes. No, using social distancing in the classrooms. No, that is almost impossible. So what I took as a stance is for as long as there is no vaccine, we will not allow face-to-face -face classes. Mm -hmm. I think that is uh, safer for us institutions because, you know, uh, after all, we are in loco parentis, no? Whatever happens to the students inside the, the campus is our responsibility. So I think it's going to be our responsibility if a student gets COVID inside our campus. That's the first thing. And for, for the second, I think uh, at the beginning of the classes, we have already laid down guidelines, you know, how to conduct ourselves online classes. You know? And I think that uh, these guidelines should be followed faithfully when we have classes you know, uh, uh, online. Uh, thank you, Father. Uh, unless the other panelists would like to say something, I think we can move on to the synthesis of this uh, very enriching uh, session. So at the beginning of this conversation, we said that we are working towards critiquing our responses institutionally and uh, collectively. And if ever there had been problems, challenges, commonalities, uh, points of confluence that we have to become mindful of. And indeed, um, while at the beginning there seemed to be no unity, there's some coordination, but there are lots of commonality to borrow the words of uh, Dr. Hill. I perfectly remember that. Um, at the end of the day, we are now in a constant dialogue, to borrow the words of uh, Dr. Atherton, that allows us to question the truthfulness of information and things that we need to problematize institutionally and collectively. And Father Gilbert uh, did tell us that once we consider how these dialogues enable us to think of common solutions, you know, the burden, the crisis, or the burden of carrying the, uh, the crisis itself becomes easier and lighter to bear. And I think that's the kind of message of hope that we were able to gather from our uh, distinguished uh, panelists. And so I will give them a quick, um, uh, a quick period for them to give us uh, their parting words uh, or some words of encouragement, perhaps, as all of us uh, continue to uh, work towards the period of recovery. So let's begin uh, with... Um, uh, Dr. Sanjaya from uh, Sajipranata University. Dr. Yes. Sanjaya. 
Thank you, Dr. Ed. Yeah, uh, I can say that uh, the condition of each institution might be different, but there is always room to collaborate to strengthen one another. Thank you. Wow, short and sweet, Dr. Sanjaya. Terima kasih. Uh, now let's move on to uh, Father Gilbert. And after Father Gilbert, we'll have uh, Dr. Gray Matherton and then finally Dr. Isabel Hill. Father Gilbert. Yes, this pandemic has really given us uh, a grim reality, you know, especially in the educational landscape. But there are very positive lessons that we have learned, especially in coordination among our schools in helping our schools also get up you know, from uh, the difficulties that they are experiencing and also on reaching out to our students more than when we had face-to-face -face with them. Now that they are online, we are reaching out to them more. You know? So I think this has given us also a lot of lessons and good lessons that we, we can carry on even in uh, a post-pandemic reality. Uh, thank you, Father. Uh, now we move on to Dr. Gray Matherton. Thank you, Ed. And I think in a positive way, I think the, the need for dialogue, the commonality of the challenge has brought us together with, with people, with groups who we weren't working with before. We, we didn't know that they had the same thoughts and same values as we had perhaps and or the same challenges. It's, it's opened up a, a set of concerns. I mean, like any sector, you build false walls between groups of each other, between disciplines. Disciplines are things, for instance, that we created academic disciplines. We created them as people. They don't sit as, they don't sit outside of our own creation. Mm -hmm. And neither does, does the, the, the point of equity or success or et cetera, that these things can be brought together. And I think to an extent, I think what the, the pandemic has done by, by forcing us to, to engage with each other, that has happened. But I, I think the, 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 the challenge though is that when things um, return to some level of normal, you often can then return back to your silo. Will you go back mm. to where you were before? You know, will, will, will some of the openness for communication? And I think also we talked a lot about students in our session today. And I think I like some of the points that, that, that Dr. Sajwaya and, and Father Gilbert said that possibly we've, we've had to become closer to understanding our students more than we did before. We always want to understand them, but it's made us understand them more. But what we don't want to do is go back to where we were before. That, you know, we, because as I said in my first uh, comments, there'll be a natural tendency to want to return back to what we felt we've missed and lost, uh, which is an actual thing. We can't, we can't resist that tendency. But what we also want to do is take is pull from what has been, you know, let's be fair about it, you know, a, a situation of huge misery and huge suffering and pain for so many people. But what we can bring out of that in a positive way in our own sector, we need to try and do and hold on to those thoughts, that those things going forward. But that will require all sorts of things leadership leadership at the global at the micro level leadership within institutions people to become and step forward as leaders in their own departments and teams now and and so there's positives coming from now thank you uh, dr graham and now uh, dr hill from the international federation of catholic universities dr fermin let me just say what an honor it has been to participate in this panel and with, to engage in this global dialogue with the colleagues um, well, I, I think what this pandemic has shown, it has somehow brought us closer to the realization uh, of what something Pope, Pope Francis has mentioned, that to be an educator is to be a crisis manager. It's not mm. to work, uh, it's not business as usual. We are implied in the process of engaging with and educating, forming another human being and um, uh, we take that risk in we manage that risk uh, and what the, dr punai was saying about re being responsive this is what uh, an education uh, an educator has to be aware of and this is something that institutions have to take into their mission uh, and 
and and and into the the way they um, plan strategically for their uh, actions in the world. Um, so basically, the crisis has brought us closer to what our mission is, and if we learn something from this. Um, we will uh, uh, leave this moment um, more aware um, um, with a stronger empathy for our constituencies and our students, and certainly with more instruments to deal with the huge challenges, social, political, economical, religious that we face, values, which is very important for our institutions that we face every day in our communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill, and to, uh, to our participants and to the officials of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, please uh, join me in giving our virtual clap to our four wonderful international panelists. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful insights. And indeed, based on your insights, we were able to answer the question set for this session, which is, on critiquing crisis response, did we provide a unified but also contextualized uh, response? The National Higher Education Commission has actually prepared some questions that you can use at an institutional level to reflect further on the inputs and insights provided by our four esteemed uh, uh, panelists. And hopefully you can extend this dialogue at the level of your respective institutions. And then by tomorrow, come back and participate at the nine o'clock in the morning session on creating our process where we will answer the question, what internal institutional dilemmas might have fueled more issues at this point? So tomorrow, uh, today from a global perspective, tomorrow we reflect on our, reflect, uh, on our individual and institutional contexts because that should be able to guide us further into making more relevant and uh, transformative decisions in the coming days. So please watch out for the next uh, summit discussion tomorrow. That's from 9 to 12, uh, 9 to 11 in the morning. And again, it will be featured over uh, Facebook Live and our YouTube channel for CEAP. Now, a quick reminder for our higher education institution study, for all the Catholic HEI school heads and administrators in attendance, We'd like to appeal for your help in participating in our baseline study. It is ongoing and you will be contacted by the National Secretariat to answer the survey tool. This will help us begin our further dialogue in helping us strategize how we can move forward as a community of, higher educa of Catholic higher education practitioners. So we'd also like to thank um, our partners for this learning session, uh, Rex, um, Bookstore, Epson, Raxo City for their support in making uh, this conversation happen. And once again, in behalf of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, we give our deep appreciation to Dr. Graham Atherton of NEON, Dr. Isabel Capeloag Hill of the Catholic University of Portugal and the International Federation of Catholic Universities, Dr. Ridwan Sanjaya of the ASIACU and Father Gilbert Sales of the St. Louis University, our representative to this uh, international panel. In the Philippines, we say, Maraming maraming salamat po at pagpalaing tayong lahat ng may kapal. Thank you so much and may the good Lord bless all of us. Until maraming next time, salamat. everyone. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you.
akong anyo Isang bansang may bagong sigla Dahil sa ikaw at ako Natuto sa prinsipyong Anyo at servisyong totoo Yeah.